those key things don't sound sexy, but that is the only thing that will truly get you out of the business. And I talk a lot online and on Instagram and stuff, and I record these videos to show these things. And then I'm like, this is how I work two hours a week in my business. What's up, everybody? My name is Mike Shogren here with my co-host, Emmanuel Pani. We're part of a group of specialized real estate investors you've probably never heard of. We didn't start with deep pockets or wealthy families, and we don't rely on 401ks, mutual funds, or traditional real estate investing. In fact, many of us don't even own the properties that fund our freedom. If you ask the money experts out there, they'd say what we do is impossible, yet it's happening every single day. It's happening through a new niche called short-term rentals. We are Short-Term Rental Nation, and these are our secrets. What's going on, STR Nation? Welcome back to another episode of the Short-Term Rental Secrets Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Shogren, here with my main man and brother from another mother, Mr. Emmanuel Pani. What is up, E? My brother, good morning. Um, we have a hurricane coming, maybe, who knows? So that's, been, yeah, it could be exciting. Um, but hey, at least this is the first year that the villas have brand new roofs and impact windows. So it's technically the best year for this to potentially happen to us. Uh, so hopefully it doesn't happen, but it's always so interesting, right? When you see people and you see people freak out and you see the news and grocery stores are out of water and, you know, it's always the same stuff and it's very interesting, you know, like given like you have to be ready, right? But is the, is the fear component and how crazy people get and just how rude people get when they're in fear. That is always such an interesting thing for me to witness, you know, and that like scarcity and freak out and you're just like guys like we don't even know if it's coming yeah and we live in florida we're kind of used to this it'd be like people freaking out for a blizzard in massachusetts like they, but you know what i'm saying it's just like and like the water thing like i'm like like i don't know why you need so much water <laughs> like you know what i'm saying like i'm just like why like why do you have to take three 24 cases of water like just take one or maybe like you know what i mean like why like there's no thought about that the next person, which is very sad to me, you know what I mean? But other than that, it's good. I, I hope I bought enough beer and wine. That's really the, <laughs> the main problem in life. It's like, do we have enough beer and wine? Or is it like, or is it like the movies that you'd buy enough just to wait for the storm and then the trailers are done and the storm is not even here and you're already out of wine and you're just like, I mm. did not plan this well. Um, but hopefully it's not the case, you know? But how are you, man? Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. Um, we're back into soccer season with Caden. So, dude, I find it interesting. He's six years old, right? So I'm thinking soccer. Okay, cool. We'll have, you know, one thing a week on Saturdays. No, we have practices on Monday night at like 630 after he's dog tired from school. And then we got games and practice at 8 a.m. on Saturdays. I'm like, dude, they're six. It's a little aggressive. Like, that's yeah, it's, you know, we're not in, this is just like a little town league. I'm like, this isn't like, yeah training for uh professional soccer here but whatever yeah. he's, he's liking it so that's been good man and just making progress on the um the new hotel deal we should have term sheets from at least two lenders this week so that'll be good to review that's and um yeah man yeah I'm, I'm excited this will be a big one um so those of you guys that haven't been caught up on the show we got a 57 unit hotel under contract so super excited for that supposed to close in December and then we've got a good like six to seven month renovation um but real good deal solid deal like over 50 percent cash on cash return like it's it's a real good deal so super excited for that yeah it looks awesome yeah so uh but what we want to talk about today was just doing kind of a recap and lessons learned from the Miami retreat so a lot of good stuff covered had a ton of good feedback about this event and just like the way that it was run and just the vibe from it. Very, very different than Nashville. Nashville was amazing. This one was a much smaller, more intimate event. So we had, you know, the welcome party the first night sponsored by Minoan. Like we got a yacht and cruised around the harbor in Miami. It was awesome. A lot of networking. And then on Monday and Tuesday, we kind of did like two half days where we went to like, well, we started at nine and went till two. And then after that, it was more like masterminding around you know, the pool or the beach or around the bar at the hotel or whatever, and just a lot of good networking connections. Um, but there were kind of five core things that I wanted to recap to help people think through, you know, their short-term rental business. And the first one was 
uh, Jeff Hampton's talk. So Jeff, Jeff's a member of our mastermind and our seven figure boardroom. And he's also a member of Bill's mastermind, right? So he believes big in education and networking and all that stuff, but he's an asset protection attorney. And he broke down, you know, this very unique asset protection strategy that he's actually redoing for all of my stuff right now. But the key point is like, you want to think through that stuff when you start building your business, because the worst thing would be, you know, you build this thing up over a few years, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears go into it. You get it to a point where you're, you know, very profitable, your net worth is up and then something happens at a property. And if you're not well protected and somebody comes at you and sues you or whatever, and then you lose it all, it's like, man, if I just had the right strategy and protection plan up front, this would have made my life way easier. So at some point we'll have Jeff on the podcast. I know he's um, ramping up this whole uh, separate business venture for him where he's just strictly focusing on short-term rental operators because he's an investor in short-term rentals as well. But he's kind of repositioning a lot of his law firm to focus specifically on short-term rental asset protection. So yeah, I, I really liked um, Jeff's perspective for a couple of reasons, right? But the main one was the fact that he used to be a litigator and so he's like, he brings an approach to it that is, that is super interesting because it's like, I'm not telling you things that I think may be something. It's like, I'm telling you things that I've used in the past. Yeah. He out. knows where all the loopholes are to get through and breach all that stuff so he can get the most you know? amount of money for people coming and, at you. And what's crazy is like, one is always the reminder of like, before you build a house, really build a solid foundation because like once you have the house built, it's not impossible to add on to the foundation. It just becomes a lot more, more difficult, right? So he's the perfect example of that. Two is really having knowledge of understanding of how to play the game and the rules of it. One of the things that him and I were talking about by the pool is like so many people create LLCs and then limited liability partnership, right? And he's like, but there are single individual LLCs. He's like, if you're a single individual LLC, I look at it as an attorney. I'm like, it's not a partnership. It's just a single person owning this. It's like, there's no protection. Another thing that he talks about is the commingling of funds. And it's like, you need to be careful because if not, if I can show the two things are connected to each other, I take you to court and there is nothing. So it's all those little things that you like, we are, he's like, we all commingle funds. Like, that's a thing that like happened every once in a while people do it. But it's like, if you're trying to protect yourself, you have to be careful because if you're trying to tell me that the two things are separate, but then I can find a money trail between the two of them, I got you. Yeah. You know, so it's all understanding those things that you're like, Ugh, I'm not there yet. And I'm like, I get it. You don't have to, like, you know what I mean? Like, but even having that conversation and knowing about it, just so you can start putting yourself, just creating the right kind of system. Even if you don't going to use it right from the beginning, just like, Hey, Jeff, like what would be the perfect kind of like business structure for me and where would I do it? Like, do I register here? Do I register here? What kind of like entities do I need? And it's the understanding that like, and this is what I loved about the Miami event is like the national event had all type of levels, right? Like there was people that were just getting started, people that had a couple of units, people that had like 15, 20 units. I felt the Miami event had more people that had a higher number of units. And the second part of the game for me is like, yes, now that you have established yourself and you're starting to make some money, how do you protect your money? Jeff, like, right, good legal. And then the other thing is good accounting. Those are the two ways that you protect and grow your wealth. That is just not, you know, because we can always get wealthier just by making more money. It also comes to a point that you have to protect your money and make sure that your money is not necessarily making more money, but you're not losing any money or things that you can help yourself. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm trying to keep myself on mute because we're recording this on a Sunday and everybody's up for their Sunday joy rides on Harleys and everything else. And it's <laughs> loud as hell outside of my office. So, uh, but the next thing that I wanted to bring up that I honestly thought was, I'm going to change up the order that we were going to do this. But the next thing I wanted to bring up was a lot of people that I talked to, they're like, hey, my property isn't bringing in as much as I thought. And I said, okay, well, what were your projections and how did you underwrite the deal at the beginning? And they were not analyzing deals. Like they were just like, oh, it looks like a good deal. The agent told me it could do this. And so we just bought it. So you have got 
to analyze properties yourself, do your own homework before you purchase a property or before you do an arbitrage deal or before you take on a co-host client, you have to run your numbers to know if it makes sense. And if you don't know how to do that, or if you don't have a deal analyzer, no problem. Like go to strsecrets.com slash resources. I will give you our deal analyzer and free training on how to analyze markets and analyze properties because I was honestly shocked how many people were not running numbers. And that is the fastest way to get into trouble and get into the wrong deals. And if you do that, it's too late to fix it. And likely you're going to have to sell it. And right now you're probably going to sell it at a loss. So you've got to know your numbers. So we'll put the link in the show notes, but just go to strsecrets.com slash resources. And just another random quirk, you got to put the www in there at the beginning. I don't know why, but the website's weird. If you don't, you're going to get some weird WordPress error. Again, I'm not a tech person, but go grab the resources because it's free and it'll at least show you how to analyze deals properly. You know, you know what's funny? It's it's I'm always a reminder of of one of our mentors always always said like, you know, like you buy you make money in real estate when you buy. And I think in different seasons of the market, people kind of tend to forget. But to me, in the moments that things are starting to get shaky, I always go back to like really good fundamentals. And that's the fundamentals of economics are not going to ever change. They kind of remain the same, right? And like, I I understand the need for people to like just take action and then like you just kind of say yes and figure out later kind of thing. You just go for it. But you you owe it to yourself to like know your numbers. Because one of the things that Bill was talking about is like, I know my numbers so well that I know I can put my risk factor to less than 5%. That's an educated gamble, right? As far as I'm concerned, because 5%, you're like, eh, well, maybe something can happen, but it's going to be like a, a temporary thing, if, if anything, right? Because like you can't live in a world of wishful thinking, even as nice as that may be. And especially with money, because like if the market does adjust 15, 20% in value, and on top of that, your occupancy drops 10, 15%. What are you going to do? Right? Like, do you have the reserve? Because that's the thing the bill talks about is like, even if you had the right numbers, you need to have some reserves now because we just don't know what's happening. Right? We know, just don't know what's coming. And knowing your numbers, it doesn't, it's not going to like prevent shit from happening. Right? But at least when it happens, you're aware of it, right? It's kind of like the difference about like being in the ring for a fight and just getting randomly punched in the face when you're walking on the street. You know what I mean? Like in the ring, you're like, I know this is may, may come. So you're more or less ready. It's a different thing if you just walk outside your house and somebody just whacks you in the face and you're like, wait, what happened? You know what I mean? But we just need to be ready, you know? Yeah. And if you don't know your numbers at all, like if it, it's a total gamble. Like it's a complete roll of the dice to see if it's going to work. So again, I don't want to beat that point down. I kind of do because it's that important, but like you've got to know your numbers, right? But so also on a single property, a little bit of numbers make a difference. So yeah. if you're, if you're going to, if like, you know what I mean? Like if your profit at the end of the year was supposed to be like 20, 25 K and you're over budget on something five to 10 grand, yeah, we can't from trash like, goes off. Yeah. You can fix like you can't fix it after. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't fix it afterwards. Cause like that's what it was, you know? Yep. And there's so much resource out there now, like SDR insights. And there's so many like air DNA, like things that like weren't really around where me and Mike got started, but like everything is there. Just don't 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 be an ostrich. Like don't don't just put your head in the sand. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, the next thing, and I know you got a lot out of this was, was Julie's presentation, right? And this kind of go back, goes back to the strategy when you're starting this thing, understanding what is my end game and what's my primary goal, right? So if you're, if you're starting this business, especially on like the management or co-hosting side, and the goal is eventually to sell your business, there are things that you need to understand and structure the correct way so that it's possible and it makes it more attractive for buyers to purchase your business, right? And so 
we'll get into this after, but one of the big things is like SOPs and having the right team members in place so that like you are not your business because nobody wants to buy a job. They want to buy a business. Mm -hmm. But the next thing was around the way she structured her contracts. I know that was a light bulb thing for you. So I'll let you kind of dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, just just honestly. And it's and it's such an easy thing to again, going back to like building the foundation, right? It's such an easy thing to add at the beginning. If you can just add a little thing in there that just says assignability. The contract is assignable under this condition to anybody, right? And it's one line, but can make all the difference in the world from you being able to have something to bring to some, like, you know what I mean? If uh, Bacaza or like a Salmers or like whoever comes up to you and is like, how many, yeah, I have a hundred management units. It's like, okay, can, are they assignable? They're like, yes. And already, like, you know what I mean? It's something that like, if it's not there, it doesn't mean that it can't happen. It's just more complicated. And like, all we need to do is just like line up for the exit that we want without necessarily having to do anything, just have it as an option. Cause again, like I love Julie because she makes it sound so easy because it was so smooth for her. Like she didn't overcomplicate her life, right? Like she was on one OT, like she only worked on Airbnb. She stayed busy. She didn't have a bunch of the systems and remote locks. Like she meant, she sent people over there to meet people. But what she did have is SOP, a team, and an assignable contract. So even with her business not being dialed in as great as it could be, right? Like no direct booking site, no anything, but she had enough of a business with SOP and, and assignability and money, right? Like she made money, like there was a good amount of profit in there, but then she got to sell the business. Because if not, if you don't have the SOPs, you don't have the team, doesn't matter how amazing Julie is, nobody wants it. Yeah. And the other thing that she mentioned, which makes complete sense, is a lot of those companies, when you go to sell your business and they're going to buy it, <clears throat> if they're smart, they want to keep you on for six to 12 months and they'll pay you in increments to make sure that those clients stay on. Because I remember talking to Brooke Fouts, who we've had on the show before, and Vintori's a sponsor of the podcast. And he's, I, I forget the exact number, but it was some crazy amount. Like the, the turnover after somebody gets acquired of like clients leaving that company was like, it was like 30 or 50% or something crazy. It, it's high. Leave. Yeah. It's, it's really high. high. So the way to minimize that is to keep whoever that business owner is on staff as an employee for six, to 12 months to facilitate that transition to make sure everything goes good. And then they get their final payout. So they'll get some up front, but then the rest of it, they have to ease into and make sure that they continue to hit those, those numbers for the new company. Yeah. And the other thing that I, like, I realized from Julie is really like what... There is not like a one way fits all kind of thing. So it's like, even on your exit, there's like, what can you think about and what can you ask? Right. Cause we have met people that like, I know Julie, like you can still stay involved in the company, even after you do a full exit, you know, you can still get a percentage of the company. You can get a percentage of the profit share. So it's like really understanding, like how good of a machine are you building? will really determine what you can ask on the way out. Yeah. A hundred percent. The next thing I want to talk about was, do you know how to diagnose your listings? Because I know right now it's kind of a weird time, even for some of our properties, you know, over 2020 and 2021, like they, they went real strong through the fall. Some of them tend to drop off a little bit this year. And a lot of people are freaking out. And it, the question becomes, okay, do you know how to diagnose your listing and figure out what's going wrong so that you can adjust that? And one of the ways that we do that is through Rank Breeze. And Calvin Ma, the founder, was one of the speakers in Miami. And like he broke down how to use Rank Breeze to do that. And, you know, we use them constantly in our business. We have our weekly staff meeting and we review all of our KPIs and see which properties are struggling. And the first question I ask is, okay, did you go into Rank Breeze and compare that to our comps to see like, what are our comps uh, pricing at? Where are they ranked versus us? Mm -hmm. And figuring out what needs to get changed, whether it's pricing, whether it's a listing, whatever it is, so that we know what levers to pull if stuff starts to fade. Right. And that's super, super important. And one of the things I liked about Rank Breeze is when you make a change to your listing, you can use their, um, 
they have like a log that you can just put in a little note of like, Hey, I changed my title on this day, or I changed, I rearranged my photos on this day. I added new photos. I changed my description, whatever it is. And then it puts a little line down your timeline and you can track to see, did that change help me or did it hurt me? Yeah. Right. Because a lot of people, they go in and they change a bunch of stuff, but then if you, if you don't measure it, you don't know if it's working or not. So you got to, to have a way to track that to know what levers are working otherwise yeah. you're just shooting in the dark and and honestly i think that there's such an important kind of feature for you to like even if it's not necessarily on your listing optimization but finding a way to understand when you make improvements how they work so another member of our seven figure boardroom cam she 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 took massive action, sent out an email list. She had an email list, now cleaned it up, 3,500 people, mailed out to a bunch of people, got a bunch of responses. Then she's like, I've done so many things that like, you don't know, I don't know which one is which, right? So there is the one component of like, yes, the massive action is great, but two, we all, and maybe not all of us, I know me and Mike work on a budget and we don't have infinite amount of money. So like any effort you want, you want to track it and make sure that it's working or like make sure that it's going the, as far as you thought it was going to go, right? Because again, like knowing your numbers, it works even here, right? So what is the point of you putting all this work behind email marketing or this and this if it's not giving you any results versus, you know what I mean? Like Rank Breeze makes it super clean, right? You're like, I changed my order of pictures, occupancy went up, great. But what other areas of your life are you putting massive efforts into something that you have no way of tracking? And maybe it's just a KPI. Maybe it's just our, our good friend, uh, Trishan talks about like custom phone numbers so that you can track when you do marketing, right? How successful it is. And there are little adjustments that are worth it just to see where your effort is going and where your energy is going. And then is it going where it's actually helping you or are you putting just a bunch of effort and energy into something that really when you look at it and you track your numbers is not making any real difference to your life. Yeah, hundred percent. And I just pay people to do that. Honestly, at this scale, like we work with an agency that <clears throat> does all the SEO stuff for us. And then we meet once a month, I get a report or same thing. These different phone numbers got called based off these different campaigns. This one's working. This one's not like redirected to here. Do all these different things. And it, it sounds complicated at the beginning, but it's really not. But this is, these are the things that differentiate, differentiate you as a business owner versus just like an Airbnb host, right? Mm -hmm. The hospitality side is, is one component, but then as a CEO and a business owner, there's this whole other avenue to go down to really grow, scale, and maximize your business. Yeah. And, and the marketing thing, right? Like another thing that we didn't talk about, but. I'm just going to throw in here, which I so appreciate about Bill is his ownership of being the fact that he's a great marketer. And that's the thing, right? Like marketing is one of those like universal Jedi ninja skills that allows you to, once you really own it, you're successful in any business because you understand attention and you understand how to talk to people. And like, I think that the reason we built in such a short time has been so impactful in the way that he like drives like ADR is because he understands attention. He understands email marketing and understands marketing in general. And like that way you can like do a lot more because you know how to speak to people. And like, it's one of those things that I'm like, it's, it's, it's. It's a Jedi skill, like, right. Like to know how to better sell, how to better write copy, how to better influence people through your marketing, through your writing. It's, it's really one of the things that like, if you have as a superpower, you can come into, and I, I personally think you can go into any business, look at how it is and be like, how can I sell this in a better way? hundred percent. One of the biggest things that I got when we went to that Grant Cardone 10X conference back in like 2019, something that stuck with me from that event was it's not about the best product. It's always the best marketed product always wins always. And you may be looking at your property right now and you're like looking at your comps and you're like, 
man, my price, my property is so much better than those. It's a marketing thing. They're just marketing it better, whether it's through better photos, better copy, maybe they're running ads to it, a direct booking website, whatever it is, they're just marketing their property better than you are. And it, it might be a tough pill to swallow, but it's absolutely true. Yeah. And so it, it, it don't matter. It don't matter if your house is the prettiest one on the block. You know what I mean? There's so much more. And like, I love the analogies of cars. Like if I give you, and like F1, like if anybody else likes watching F1, like I love F1. Because F1 to me, it's all amazing top tier drivers, like the best of the best. But then you realize that some years based on how their car performs, how their team performs, how their mechanic performs, and you really start to see the ecosystem, right? Of like at a pit stop, like those extra three to four seconds lose your race. And so like, it's really like only the fact of like how, like you can just have a great car can just have a great listing without great copy, without great marketing. Because if you're missing any of those components, it don't matter. Like, it don't matter if you're like Lewis Hamilton. Like, if you're Lewis Hamilton, but you're driving on an old Honda Civic. <laughs> you see that right how, now. How well, can, like, how well can you, like, you know, how well, that's what I mean, right? Like, how well can you do, you know? And it's such a, like, perfect combination that it's just like, it's a perfect storm, but it's, it's all components, know your number, rank breeze, optimize, really understand legal. Like that's why we're so adamant about like the ecosystem of you as a business. Yep. hundred percent. So I like to break business down into like three different buckets. Like you've got your growth bucket, like the marketing and lead gen and all that stuff. Then you have your operational bucket of how do you fulfill on those leads and execute and then you have your like finance and admin, all the back office stuff that you got to do as a business owner. And if you don't have, if you're not analyzing your business holistically from that sense, you're, you're probably leaving money on the table. And so in my, one of my talks, I talked a lot about how do you build SOPs and how do you elevate yourself to that CEO role? Because it doesn't happen overnight and it's not going to happen without systems and a team. So how, how do you create those systems? How do you recruit, onboard, train, and lead a team? How do you run your meetings? What KPIs do you review on a weekly basis? Like those key things don't sound sexy, but that is the only thing that will truly get you out of the business. And I talk a lot online and on Instagram and stuff, and I record these videos to show these things. And then I'm like, this is how I work two hours a week in my business. And I get so many trolls and haters that are like, that's bullshit. You, there's no way you're working two hours a week in this business. Like there's way too much to do. And I'm like, yes, I do because I just build better systems and have a better team than you do. Like, that's it. That's but also like, uh, you, y'all don't see like the years of, oh uh, yeah. Like, I'm five like, you know what I mean? Like you, you work two hours now, but I remember like the years of you being like late night birding burning the candle and waking up at five o'clock in the morning. Like that's the thing, like it's the why, right? And so like, if, if, if you, it's the why and the business that you create around it to create the sustainable. And like, again, like I, I am the first person to acknowledge this because I didn't have as much purpose into building my team as you have. And like, you can, you can see it, right? Like that's why I walk around the conference. I still have two phones, right? Like I have my personal phone, I have my business phone, right? And like that it's just because my system are not as well dialed in as yours are, but also because I didn't, I didn't build them that way from the beginning, right? Like I was a little worker bee for the longest time. Like I was the maintenance guy and I kind of like had that mindset for a very long time. And like, I remember thinking like, I don't deserve to have a team of people around me, right? Like I remember hiring Joyce, my first VA, and it was just like, <sighs> I deserve help. That's amazing. Like, you know what I mean? And like, but it, it's, it's needed. Like, you know what I mean? If not, it's, you just have jobs. And that's, and, and that's okay if that's what your goal is. Right. And that's, that's your thing. Like, I think it works so well with Bill and I, cause we're very, very different. And our business strategy is totally different where like, I've got a bunch of units. Like after this deal, I'll be over a hundred units. And our, the way that our business is set up is totally different. Like I have a f team of six people. It'll probably grow to eight or somewhere between eight and 10 to take on this next larger deal where Bill, it's like him and Chris, 
right? And they pretty much do everything. And he wants to keep his port portfolio smaller and focus on high end properties, right? And that's cool. Or a lot of people, they're like, you know what? I like my job. I want to have a couple properties on the side. I don't mind responding to guests here and there and make a few grand on the side. Like that's totally cool. But it's just defining what your goal is from the beginning so that you can build it effectively and use your time wisely. Because when I was putting in those long hours, part of what I was focusing on was building those systems, building those standard operating procedures, recruiting people, training them, doing all those things. Because I knew my finish line was to get to the point where I was working two hours a week. I was producing at the beginning. It was like, I needed to get to 15 grand a month as quickly as possible. Now, obviously that's grown quite a bit since then, but like my goal was the time freedom. So I was ruthless about spending any free time I had analyzing how can I delegate this? How can I continue to grow the business as effectively as possible? Like that's where my sole focus was growing. So it just depends on what your goal is. And I get it. Most people like I and E at the beginning had jobs, whether whatever that is, could be a corporate job, could be a maintenance guy like E, like I get it. You don't have a lot of time. You got family, you got all this stuff. So with that time that you do have, how do you be as strategic and as efficient as possible to put the right things in place to achieve your goal? Mm -hmm. And, and in this moment, I always like, I always want to bring awareness to like the difference between efficient and effective work and busy work. So like, as you build in your systems, make sure that like you, you, when you get, get going for the day or for the week or for the month of understanding the rocks, they're actually going to create something that you can build on top of and the stuff that just keeps you busy. Sometimes at the beginning, the busy work is, is a requirement un until you have the team that can do the busy work, right? And what I mean by that is like, if you don't have a team and you have to go put in a new schlag and code on a door and you don't have a team that's your job right but don't have that feel i am growing my business because you're not you have a job so you have to find a way before or after that one task how are you creating something how are you creating a new system why are you recording you doing something that you're teaching to somebody else because that should be like in your in your day to day thing. There should be a thing that is like the busy work and the important work, and the important work needs to be done when it's not urgent. It's important, but it's not yet urgent, and that's what grows the business. And then you go like, okay, now I've done the important urgent work. I've literally like pushed my rock a couple meters ahead. This is all the, all I have time for in this moment. That's fine. And then you can go out and do the busy work, but it has to be a daily effort into, okay, like, am I building, a, did I build SOPs today? Right. And it's almost like building like a Lego head, right? Like maybe you don't have time to do the whole bag of Legos, but just, can you every day put a couple pieces in? You're like, okay, this is going somewhere. Now I have to go deal with the busy work. And then you come back and you're like, I have. 15, 20 minutes, can I build something else? And you put a couple more pieces, right? The beauty is like over time, you'll have more time to do Lego heads. No, I'm joking. More time to <laughs> onboard clients and do things that are like, you know, more higher productive things because you've delegated all the busy work that though sometimes feels great. Like I love it. I love having days when I'm like out driving and doing things and because you still get the dopamine hit of, of doing something. Checking, but the good news checking is, shit off your list. Yeah, but the good news is the dopamine hit of the thing that you dread, that you view as difficult and complicated. Once you get it done, it's going to feel so much more rewarding than you going and installing eight locks. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because then it also has the intrinsic value of like, I've created a system. I created a business. I created, this is a part of my bigger vision to my bigger why as to why I'm doing everything that I'm doing. Yep. That's it. That's it. So again, 
pay attention on your strategy. Make sure you get yourself set up to, right from the beginning, which is in alignment with where you're going, right? Whether your aim is to sell the business, keep it small, go big, whatever it is, get that defined at the beginning. Know how to diagnose your listing, analyze your properties properly before you purchase or co-host or arbitrage anything. And again, I've got a free deal analyzer and a bunch of free training you can check out at strsecrets.com slash resources. Um, take advantage of that. Again, it's totally free. Like go grab that stuff if you don't have anything right now. Um, and then start to build and implement your systems to get your time back. So anything else? I think we're good for this week. I think we're good. Yeah. And again, guys, it, it's not scary. A system can be, you know, like a system can be anything. And like a system doesn't necessarily have to be like a person can just be a piece of tech can just be anything, you know, and, and, and just kind of take it where you are. You know what I mean? Like if you're like, you know, like, you know, the next little thing that you should be doing, just go there. Just kind of start with that. Don't, don't, you know, even if you're in Miami, like, and you like heard the whole presentations and stuff like that, and you get overwhelmed, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? You got to start with the first bite, whatever that is, just go there. And for this week, you know what I mean? Like you go into this week, Q3 is almost over, right? We're going to Q4. Don't, don't feel stressed out. You know, we still have like a long time before the end of the year, right? Just one bite. Like what's the next bite for you? And then just see what happens, you know? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And keep a, keep a lookout. Um, we'll be sending an email probably in the next week or two for the STR Wealth Conference for Nashville. It's going to be March 20th to the 22nd, 2023. Um, I know Chris is working on, on the site and finalizing some good stuff. And um, I think we already sold close to 100 tickets from the Miami event. Um, we gave them early access for, you know, being part of that. So, but that will be going public in the next week or so. So stay tuned for that. I'll give you guys more details as those come, but, uh, as always appreciate you guys. Fun fact, I was looking this up. I was talking to Will Slickers who produces the show and STR secrets is in the top 2% of all podcasts globally, by the way. So out of the 3 million podcasts, oh, we're in the top 2%, which is pretty crazy. So yeah. That's uh, a huge uh, kudos to all you guys, you guys for listening. Yeah. I'm I didn't know. That's awesome. I didn't either till yesterday. Yeah. And uh I was like, wow, man, that's that's incredible. So thank you guys. Huge, yeah. Huge shout out to you guys for for making that happen. So as always, appreciate you guys. Go out there, keep taking action, keep moving the needle, and we will talk to you guys next week. Hey, STR Nation, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes, and we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.